Can we give a hand to them and just say thank you to them? Um, we have we had students helping in the uh, with the music with the singing. We have one in the AV. We have some students helping with the nursery. We had some uh, greeting. Uh, we have some more students helping out later. So we have a lot of kids helping out this morning. So I want to say thank you to all of you all. Um, we can give you another hand. That's right. Someone said, "Happy St. Patrick's Day to me." I said, "No, Happy Youth and Children's Sunday." Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that does mean you have to listen to me preach this morning. Um, we'll get out on time, though, so that's good, right? <laughs> Someone said boo. You're not allowed to boo, okay? You don't boo him, so don't boo me. So if you are a guest with us this morning, I am the Youth and Children's Pastor. My name is Kyle, and nothing I say this morning can go against OBC. Just Pastor Tubbs, since he's my boss. Okay. Um, but Pastor Tubbs is going to be giving us a new series in the next couple of weeks called The Life We Build. He's going to be talking about building one's life. Um, what is it that's in your foundation? What is it that guides your life? What is it that guides your decision making? What is it that guides your emotions? That's a big one. Um, and so I did, a couple of weeks ago, I knew that I was going to preach on Job. Um, instead of preaching just on Job and suffering, that, that made me want to instead change a little bit. So we're still going to look at Job, but we're going to look at the foundation of Job. Um, Job goes through some pretty rough stuff, y'all, um, but he goes through it well, in my opinion. Why does he do that? And I think it's because of his foundation. And I want us to look at his foundation and see if there's something that in our foundation um, that we need to fix this morning. Raise your hand if you've gone through suffering. Raise your hand if you're going to go through suffering. Yeah, if your hand is not raised, you are definitely blessed. Um, <laughs> Uh, but hopefully that can apply to all of us this morning. We're going to read through Job. We're going to stay in Job chapters 1 and 2. Uh, it's not that the other chapters are uh, not as important, for sure. But if we want to look at Job, we need to look in chapters 1 and 2. Unless you guys just want to make this an overnight thing. And we can do the entire of the book of Job. But we don't want to do that. So let's start. We're going to read Job 1, 1 through 5. If, you know, if you've ever heard me preach, and uh, every time I preach on, on a story of the Bible, I like breaking it down and looking at different sections of that story. So let's do that. Job 1, 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, five yoke of oxen, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many slaves or servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my, my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, thus Job did continually. Everyone say continually. Good job, y'all. One thing we learned from Job here is that he was a wise man, even wiser than Pastor Tubbs. Um, but we see here in many parts of the scripture that, um, especially Proverbs, that wisdom is defined as what? A healthy fear in God, right? And chapter 1 informs us that Job did, in fact, fear God because of that he also turned away evil. Another thing we learn here from Job is that he was a very, very wealthy man. It says here that he was the most wealthy person in the huge area that he lived in. This is the guy that when, you're, when your daughter's selling Girl Scout cookies, you go to him first. And then you tell him a sob story. If my kid could only sell 50 more boxes, we could go to Disney World or wherever you're gonna, whatever you're going to get. Um, but he's the guy that everyone knows. They know him because he's wealthy. Although he was so wealthy, there is nothing else really said about his wealth except for that it gets taken away. Um, and I think that tells us that this entire story is not about Job's wealth. It's about Job's character and Job's heart. And that's pretty good for us. When, when God looks at us, he doesn't see us for what we do or what we say or how we act. But thank God that he looks at us as individual souls that will spend eternity in one or two places. Amen? Yeah. And that, that, that helps us understand as well. And it helps us ask the question, how do we see others? And how we see others is a key part of our foundation. <laughs> I'm not going to dance, I promise. Um, if God does not focus on these things when he looks at people, neither should we. 
So how do you view people? Do we see them by how they look or, or what they've done to us or what, what we think they deserve? Or do we see others with an eternal perspective? Do we have that eternal perspective? I believe Job had this in his foundation. It's a part of who he was. It said that he had a lot of stuff. He was very wealthy. But the Bible doesn't say that that's what he spent his time doing. What does it say he spent his time doing? Focusing on his own soul and the souls of his family. It said that he did that continually. Um, and I believe he very well understand, understood that his possessions were very small compared to who God is and what eternity had in store for him. What's important here is that he had that mindset before tragedy hit. Before tragedy hit. And that's important. Um, Job understood that this, is, this world was not his home. He's kind of been gone for a while, if you didn't know. Um, but this was not his home. He knew that. He was just here for a time. His fear in God was bigger than his fear of man or his love for money. That's huge. How many of us can say that this morning? So how is your foundation? First question, how do you see others? How do you view your, yourself? How do you define yourself? How you define yourself affects how you see others too. So how do you define yourself? Do you find yourself by your job, by your money, by your kids? Or do you see yourself as a soul bound for one or two places when you die as well? So maybe for us, for us to change how we see others, we first need to change how we see ourselves, where we find our identity in. So how does your identity look? Job had an eternal perspective and he saw people based on who they were to God, not how he defined them, including himself and his family. If you're a parent, can you raise your hand? Okay, you can put your hands down. Good job. Um, I just want to take a second and talk to parents for just a second. Um, I look at Job and it says he did this continually. Uh, when I read that, man, that convicted me. I don't know about the other parents in here, but let's talk about that for just a second. So how do you see your kids? How do you define your kids? Do you know that in many ways your kids' identity, it's in your hands? Your kids' identity in many ways is in your hands. What you do and what you don't do, for good or for bad. Many parents identify their kids as the sports they play, or the grades they bring home, or college, what college they may be going to, or, and maybe for a lot of parents, their, their, their biggest success or their biggest hope is that their kids end up getting out of college and becoming a successful adult. And those are good, but none of those things should identify your, by your kids because they're all going to pass away. Every one of those things will. Many parents forget that each kid is an individual soul bound for one of two places as well. Did you know that God has already given the most important job to your kids? He's already given that to them. The best thing in this world is not that our kids become successful after college, but they become men and women who win others to Jesus. So is that what drives your parenting? If not, let's change it. Let's start by changing it. Many of us parents in here have not really cared about that for a while or if ever. And it's time to change it. And I get it. You're busy. <laughs> We're all busy. If you're a parent here, you're busy. If you raise your hand, you're busy. I get that. And it's okay that you're busy, but make sure that what you're, what you're busy doing is, is worth your kids not giving a care about the gospel, okay? We need to notice that this world is not our kids' home either. We always see this world as the place where we're going to leave and our kids are going to stay here. That's not true, all right? Our kids have the ability to impact eternity. And some of us parents are kind of getting in the way of that a little bit. So if your kid does not see you give a care about the gospel, odds are they're probably not either, right? Yeah. That was hard. So let's get back on topic, okay? So Job had a lot of money, and he was probably pretty smart in how he went about his business and all of his planning and stuff like that. He was a wise guy. Um, but how business smarts was not what made him wise. Having a healthy fear in God is what made him wise. So first question, first overall question here, does your foundation fear God? Do you fear God? If not, what is it that you're fearing? 
Because whatever you're fearing, that is what's driving your decision making. That is what's driving your emotions. So is the thing that you're fearing, for many of us this morning, let's just be honest, it may be worrying what others think. Let's not let others dictate when we get emotional. Let's not let others dictate our decision making. All right, let's move to the next section. <clears throat> Job 1, 6 through 12. Job 1, 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and, <coughs> from going to and fro the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Thanks a lot, God. And there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put your hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand, touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out for him the presence of the Lord. This, hard, this part of the Bible is a little hard to read for some of us, right? And that's okay. There are many who find it hard to read this part of the Bible, even Christians. Um, it's hard for, people, so for many people to read this part of the Bible and then see God as still all loving. So many people will get upset about God, allowing this tragic thing, very, very tragic stuff that happened to Job. And they may use that for fuel in their life when, when hard times come for them to get mad at God as well. Many people do not understand why an all-loving God would allow bad things to happen to a good person for no reason, especially a dude like Job. There are people who do not believe in, the, in God for this exact reason. Many people do not believe in God for this exact reason. And it's interesting here. God doesn't just allow this to happen, as he probably does with us most of the time. He suggests it to Satan twice. He'll suggest it again when we go over the next part. Why would God do this to Job? Why would he do that? Uh, this is a good question. And this is probably a part of the Bible where we need to read and then maybe read again and then maybe look at it some more, right? Most Christians, when asked this question, they would probably just tell you this is, this is a test for Job, just as God tests us, maybe just, not just as God tests us, um, but it's a test for Job. And they'll give this answer, and they'll be like, it's a test. Boom, I'm out. I answered the question. It's done. Next question. Um, and that may be true. This is probably a test for Job. But if you're like me, that doesn't really satisfy me. I feel like there's more there. There's more than just this as being a test. And if there's someone who you're talking to who is an unbeliever, and they ask you why God allows this to happen, you should not answer with, oh, it was a test. I'll see you next Tuesday. That's not how we should answer that, right? We should, we, should, we should talk to those people, read it with them, and say, you know what? Let's look at this together, right? Um, so uh, let's try to answer this a little bit. Why would God allow this to happen? Let's give a couple more answers to this question. We need to look at this question, but we also need to keep in mind that when someone asks us the question, it's probably because, because something has happened in their life. It's probably because difficulty has happened in their life or someone they know. So when we have this conversation with someone, we need to be as loving and patient and kind as possible. Amen. Excuse me. Evangelism and having spiritual conversations is never or should never be about winning an argument. It is about loving someone as much as you possibly can. God doesn't need you to protect him. He just doesn't. He wants you to love, especially lost people. If you're someone who shares the gospel by trying to win arguments, then you are hindering people from coming into heaven. And then when you do this by representing Jesus, sometimes you're kind of saying, you know what, man, Jesus doesn't necessarily love you. He wants you to be wrong. And we don't need to do that. Some, some Christ followers do not represent Jesus well. But lost people don't know that. They can't see that. So we need to be careful and we need to just come in complete love. So let's look at this question. One thing we, need, um, we see here is that Satan is suggesting that Job only serves God 
because God has blessed Job and protected him. We see that. That's definitely true. God knows that this is not true, that that's not the reason that Job does that. Um, so it's true that God allows this, allows this hap- to happen to prove Satan wrong. Um, but it also shows us and everyone else who's ever lived that has read Job how to handle suffering. That's a little bit more of a bigger reason than this is a test for Job, right? God has allowed this for us. God allowed this to happen for us to see and go back and look at. It also teaches us that receiving blessing, blessings should not be the main reason why we follow God. So a quick question. Um, I really appreciate all the volunteers at OBC. Absolutely appreciate everyone. We have a ton of volunteers who come every Sunday. This Wednesday, there'll be a ton of volunteers. Um, and that's awesome. But I want to ask the volunteers for just a second. Why do, you, why do you volunteer? Why do you do that? Why do you serve God? If there's other ways other than volunteering at our church, which many people do, why do you do that? Is it because you, you believe you're going to get something in return? Is it because um, that's just what you've always done? Or what you were taught? Or is it because you honestly want to see the people who walk through that door to go to heaven? Is that the reason? Is that the driving force behind your volunteering? I hope so. If not, we can change that. So God allowed this to happen to Job to show us um, how to handle suffering. But there's another reason. I think there's another reason why people get so upset about this question. There's a, um, there's a belief called the principle of retribution. Everybody say retribution. retribution. That's a big word. All it means is that when you do good, you get good in return. When you do bad, you get bad in return. We know that as karma, right? We would call it karma. Retribution is the same thing. Um, so this is a part of most belief systems. Um, this, is, this is what Job's friends believed without a doubt, without a doubt. Many of the pages here in Job that we're not going to read there are how many? 42 chapters in Job. Most of those, about at least 30 chapters, is Job talking with his friends. And what they're pretty much saying is that, Job, what happened is rough. There must have been something you did to deserve this. Probably don't, don't, don't say that to people who are going through something, just let you know. Um, but many Christians do believe this. Many Christians believe in karma. They would never say it, but they do because of how they live. Many Christians believe that this is what God is about, but that's not really true. We as Christians are not to believe in retribution or karma. The world is just not that simple. It's just not. And yes, there are parts of Scripture where God says He will often bless those who serve Him, and He does. Like Proverbs 3, 9-10. through 10. And yes, this is something that God does in general. But nowhere in the Bible does God say, serve me and nothing bad will ever happen to you in the history of ever, ever. He doesn't, he just, it's not in the Bible. We live in a broken world brought on, brought on by our sin. This world is going to fail us. In fact, the Bible, the Bible tells us that life will be hard. Sometimes bad things will happen to us because we serve God. And the problem with the principle of retribution or karma is that when we believe in it, we put our hope in it. When we hope in it, we hope in this world that we already know is going to fail us. Our hope is not to be in an easy life here on earth. We already know it's not going to happen. But our hope is in God and eternity. Our hope is in in that this is not our home. Bless you. (laughs) Um, Our hope is in a place where we live forever after this place. Sometimes we get mad at God for promises that he never even gave us. We tell God our life should not be like this. Our life should be different without grief. But if we read his word, we find that that was never on the table because of our sin. Because of this world. That is why God tells us our hope is not to be in anything temporal but in him. And our hope is a part of our foundation. So I want to ask you, what what is your hope this morning? Where do you search to feel that hope, to feel that joy? Is it in your possessions, in your money, in an easy life here on earth, or is it in Christ and eternity? So where do you look to fill, fill your hope? When our hope is in eternity and we have an eternal perspective, man, that changes things. That changes how we see this world. That changes how we see other people. That changes how we see ourselves in a very real way. 
So where is your hope this morning? That, that does affect who you are. Another reason uh, God allows suffering is because that is a way he grows us. Read Rom- uh, let's read Romans 5, 3 through 5. Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only that, <coughs> not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's a good, good couple of verses right there. Um, here Paul tells us something the world cannot understand. Paul tells us that we can have joy in the midst of suffering. Yes. Not because it's fun. Not because in some way it's enjoyable. Not because that we should be happy that it came in the first place. But because the Holy Spirit can use something as tragic as, as suffering something that very well may have been designed to destroy us. And instead, the Holy Spirit uses it to produce something amazing in our life, like joy, like peace, and like hope. God can use the worst things in our lives to produce the most incredible attributes within us. That's pretty cool. Only God can take something like tragedy and use it to form our character and better us. But I need to tell you that you need that solid foundation before you go through that suffering. You need to expect suffering and be working on that before tragedy hits. If we don't have a solid spiritual foundation beforehand, then when it hits, we'll call to God, but we'll only ask him to release the pain from us. But God may may have it there for a reason. And God is using that that pain in an amazing way that we just haven't seen yet. And sometimes that that takes time. Before my family and I moved up here, we lived in Texas. That was a big move, Texas to Maryland. Uh, For about three to four years, we were in there. The last last, uh, year we were there, I did the very spiritual job, very highly spiritual job of selling dental plants. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Some of y'all like, I can't see that. And some of y'all like... I can see that. Anyways, <laughs> but that's what I did. Um, there was a lot of seminary guys who, who worked with me there, and it made for a, good, a very good atmosphere. And my boss was a very, very godly man. He was a super cool guy. He would always take at least 30 minutes to an hour every week just to talk to me and sit me down and say, hey, man, how are you doing? Um, he was a cool, cool guy, very godly man. Um, so one time he sat me down. Uh, and when, when things were going rough in my life, I had a good enough relationship with him that I would tell him, hey, man, I'm struggling right here. This is a pretty hard time in my life right now, and this is why. <laughs> and every time I did that, man, every time, there was one time he sat me down. He said, hey, Kyle, how are you doing? I said, I'm going through this. And he said the same thing every time, man. He said, <laughs> he said so what do you think God is teaching you through this? What do you think God is trying to tell you through this? And I'm like, just feel sorry for me, man. <laughs> just tell me it's going to be Okay. But that's what we want, right? When we're through suffering, we want people to feel sorry for us. But that's not what we need. We need to ask that question every day, every hour, every second while we're suffering. So if you're going through pain right now in your life, and I know many of us are this morning, ask yourself, what is God trying to teach you through this? What is he telling you through this? If you search for it, you will find it. Having this question drilled into me every time I, co- uh, I talked to this guy, it changed how I went through suffering in an amazing, amazing way. And hopefully that can help you all too. So what is God trying to tell you? So let's go back to the question real quick. Why does God allow good things to happen? <laughs> Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people for no reason? And I would say that the answer is that God does not. When suffering comes in our lives, God is there and speaking to us through His Spirit. It's not His fault if we're not listening, right? Let's read uh, the last section here of the story. We're going to read Job 1, 13 through 2.10. Job 1, 13 through 2.10. Now there was a day when the sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. That should just say grape juice. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. 
And the Sabians came upon them and took them and struck them with servants and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, there came another man, another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another who said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck them down and struck down the servants with the edge of a sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his, to- his, his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Woo. Here we see the tragedy of Job that happened. And they come in two waves. This is the first wave we just read. In the first tragedy, we learn that Job loses his, his servants or his workers, all of his possessions, and the big one, his children, all at the exact same time. Surely, whatever we may be going through this morning, it's not this bad. And this tells us that Job understood pain, and that's important. Because we cannot say, oh, well, Job responded this way in his pain, but he doesn't understand my pain. He doesn't understand me. But that's often our answer, right? When someone is speaking to us, when we're going through pain, you don't get it. You don't understand my pain. And I know it's hard. I know it's easy to give that answer. But oftentimes... When we use that, I think we do use it as an excuse to harm ourselves in some way. I think it may become an excuse to become a victim of our circumstances rather than looking for a way to grow through them. But we cannot say here, say this about Job. The reason I say this is because the next time we go through suffering, that's going to be what we want to say. But everything we talk about this morning is true for us. We're not reading about Job and his circumstance. We can apply this to us. Because he understands our pain. That's important. It's not about what kind of suffering you're going through. It's how God can use it. Then later later God allows Satan to harm Job's body. Not only has Job lost everything, he he has also lost his health now. All of this is probably the most tragic thing that's ever happened to a person. So I want to focus on Job's answer in this. Job's initial answer included two things. It included grief, and it included worship. We see Job, obviously, in extreme suffering. We see that because he he tears his robe and he shaves his beard. We also see that because of what happened to him. One only does those things if they were in extreme suffering, and Job had a lot of reasons for his sorrow, right? One thing I would like to say here is that it is okay to be sad in times of grief. It's okay to be sad, y'all. It's okay to be sad for a month or months or a year or a couple years or longer. It's okay to be sad. It's not like Job went through all this and he was like, I'm going to worship God, worship God. And then he never thought about his kids again. Right? You can be sad and still have joy. That's what Paul told us, right? Joy is not an emotion for us as Christians. It's a spiritual status for us. As Christians, we view joy differently. Our joy is connected to our hope. But it's okay to be sad in times of suffering. What we don't want to do is allow that that sadness to become anger towards God or fall in complete self-loathing. But it's okay to be sad. Some people feel like they've had time to heal from something tragic in their lives, but they still get sad sometimes. And they think that they should just be over it by now. That they should no longer be sad, and then they may even get angry at themselves for still being sad. 
But if you're going through something this morning, it's okay to be sad as long as you need. Nowhere in the, excuse me, nowhere in the Bible does it say not to be sad. Even Jesus experienced this emotion on multiple occasions. So it's okay to be sad. We just need to be sad and spiritually healthy at the same time. We do this by having a solid foundation like Job did. And that is how I feel Job was. So how does Job answer one with, with, with sadness? But he also answers in worshiping God. And that's kind of the one that blew me away. When I've read this in the past, when I say past, I mean last week, um, <laughs> I've looked at this and I've seen what Job goes through. And then I see that he worships here. And I've just thought, there's no way. There's no way. There's no way I could lose my kid and then answer in worship. Job is either just a better person than me or he's more godly because there's no way. So let me talk to that for a second. I think it's important to recognize that Job worshiped God, but he also messed up through the process. Job was not sinless in this story, but he still got through it. He messed up, but he still got through it. Just because you mess up sometimes in the midst of suffering, that does not mean that you will fail getting through it. And we know that some, uh, in some chapters down, Job does end up asking God why. And he even comes to question God's character multiple times. But Job does have a perfect initial response. And we can do the same in our suffering. We can do the same in our suffering. That may look like us saying, God, this is hard. I don't know why, and I don't know how, and I can't see it right now, but God, I will get through this. Not because of the circumstance, but because of who you are, God. We may say, God, I hate this. I don't like that you allowed this to happen. I wish you would just tell me why. But I know that you're bigger than this, God. And we can worship God in the midst of suffering. It won't be the same way we worshiped a couple minutes ago, ago, and it won't be as cute as the, the children's choir up here. But worship takes different forms. Worship's not something we do through music on a Sunday morning. Worship includes how we act and how we react and how we acknowledge who God is. Job did not pass the test because he never messed up and never asked God any questions. He passed the test because he never gave in to what both Satan and his wife were telling him, curse God and die. He didn't give in and he didn't give up. In the end, Job prevails in how he responds to suffering because he got through it and became a better follower of God. And the most tragic and unfortunate event that could ever happen to Job, he ends up worshiping God through the pain. I don't think Satan expected that. And this is doable for us as well. But again, we need to make that solid foundation before suffering hits. We need to expect suffering and then work on that before suffering ever hits. Job also gives a perfect answer to his wife. I don't know if I'd say it to my wife. But Job gives a perfect answer. Just kidding. But Job gives a perfect answer to his wife. Um, Job, Mrs. Job gets a bad rap in the Bible. Um, but just to let you know, like everything Job has lost, she's lost as well. Everything Job's going through, she's going through as well. It's not her fault that the only thing in the Bible is her saying, curse God and die. Um, but I do think she gets a bad rap. Um, but she does. She looks to Job and says, curse God and die. Job may have been tempted to get mad at God. And we see later that he does. He probably does get mad at God. But Job also understood that everything he had, where did it come from? God gave it to him anyways in the first place. A follower of God must be willing to accept both good and bad from God. Most Christians are happy to bless God and worship God in good times, but in hard times, they are very quick to turn around and forget that everything they had came from God in the first place. And Job warns his wife of doing this very same thing. How can we be mad at God for allowing something to be taken from us that came from him in the first place? As a gift. This is a hard lesson for some believers to learn, especially if they feel that they've been promised health or wealth or misunderstood that God's wonderful plan for their life only involves pleasant things without any trouble. 
So we need to understand and remind ourselves that God tells us that there will be times of suffering. And he will give us exactly what we need in those times. That's pretty cool. So how does your foundation look like today? Look at how you handled suffering in the past and see where you may need to change. Maybe some of you need to start a brand new foundation today by believing in Christ, by believing in Jesus for the first time in your life. Maybe some of you need to believe, um, maybe some of you believe in Jesus, but you don't work on that relationship with Jesus. Or you, maybe you've never read, haven't read the Bible in a long time. That's not going to help you when you go through suffering. And I know it's hard, y'all, but maybe some of us need to stop being a victim of our circumstances and start allowing God to mold us through them. When suffering comes, it'll either knock us down and we'll be victims of it, or we will thrive and receive a better understanding and a greater love for our Creator. There will be another time when you suffer in this world. That next time will come. It may be soon. It may not be soon. You may get a phone call on the way home from church today. But are you ready for it? Are you expecting it? Are you ready for it? And are you ready to suffer well? Have you made that foundation? What is your next step in building your foundation? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now. God, some of us are just suffering. Some of us are about to go through some really hard stuff. We don't even know it yet, God. And Lord, sometimes we know that you are the way to get through it, but sometimes we don't understand how. And I thank you that you've given us the book of Job to show us that. And God, I pray that we would have an eternal perspective on others, on ourselves, and on our family, God. Because when we don't, God, we get mixed up in things that are eternal, and that's when we put our hope in things that are not of you, God. So God, I pray right now for those who are in suffering, who those are not, God. We're about to go through, God. I pray that we would search for you, seek you, and work on our foundation. God, I pray that you would tell us where our next step is, God, and go from there, Lord. And as I pray right now, I ask for the ushers to come on up. And Lord, as we go through a time of giving our tithes and offering, Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Amen.